Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful, so very thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to just come together and feast upon your word. We just ask that you would filter out all of that which is foolish but seal to our hearts only truth so that we may grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com and I've done a lot of videos and I can't think of a time in which I've felt more compelled to get your attention than on these next several videos as we close out the first chapter of the epistle to the Philippians. We've been studying through it verse by verse, and in our last study together, we were at the 27th verse of chapter 1. Paul, an apostle, uh, imprisoned in Rome, the, the heart of God revealed in, in longing to be with his people and for us to trust and to rest in him and we've seen that it's important for us to be here or we wouldn't be and that God has a purpose in that if there was no purpose for us to be here we wouldn't be here dearly beloved God is almighty God we don't limit God and much of modern Christianity thinks that God is limited by what he can do because of human will over and over and over again I hear the statement that God never overrules the mind and the will of man and until I come to the Word of God I might be tempted to believe that and yet God's Word clearly shows that God always overrules the mind the will of man Adam Abraham, Noah, David, Paul, you, me. And I know a God who does all things right, who works all things after the counsel of his own will, and who is working in me and you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And in the 27th verse, we were told... To let your activity in the body, in the body of Christ, be equal to the good news of Jesus Christ. That he died in your place, that he made you righteous, striving for the faith of the gospel. Standing fast with one mind, settled on things above. And now we come to this 28th verse that we've touched on in the past several videos, but I want to spend some t serious time looking at this and in nothing terrified by your adversaries in no thing terrified by your adversaries and i want to i want i want i would like to spend two at least two videos i would like for us to suspend ourselves over this verse the last several verses spend at least two videos on this because of, of just how important that it is. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue is what we read. I believe in Peter. 2 Peter 1.3 All things. He's given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. We know that there's one who opposes and exalts himself above all that it's called God. And that is our word here in the text. Nothing terrified by your adversaries. Uh, 
uh, why should I in nothing, no thing, be terrified? Well, because God has supplied all things necessary for life and godliness, and because the Holy Spirit is not just with me, but the Holy Spirit is living in me, we have the evidence of God's gift of the Holy Spirit as a down payment on my inheritance. A down payment. And the evidence of that, the earnest of that, is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, that, that didn't seem like much to me when I was younger. But I tell you, there is not enough money, there's not enough fun or pleasure or desires in all of the universe that would buy from me the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit and the confidence that is mine in the truth of the Word of God. In not one thing terrified, my authorized version says. Let's look at that word. The word is used in the classical Greek of a horse who is calmly grazing in the pasture, and then all of a sudden, the horse is startled, and it bolts, and it runs. And I believe that's what's in the mind of Almighty God as he tells us this. Don't be startled in such a way that you would move from that place of confidence that place of, of confidence, of peace, of rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. And those are easy words to say until we stand in judgment against Israel, who had seen the power of God's redemption in the land of Egypt, saw the destruction of the armies of Pharaoh, a miraculous preservation in the wilderness. I want you to think of the magnitude of that. And when the nation is in difficulty, God says, don't turn to Egypt. And what do they do? They turn to Egypt for help. You know, Egypt was something tangible, something that they could see. And surely they, they would not have turned to Egypt had they not had confidence. Okay. That the power, okay, the power. And the armies of Egypt would be sufficient to aid them in their conflict against Babylon. God had told them it wouldn't work. Then God told you and me that it won't work we turn to man for our strength we turn to man for our sufficiency when it is god who has supplied all things necessary for life and godliness dearly beloved not man not your work not the banking system but god uh, why should we judge Israel for turning to Egypt when we turn so quickly from the sufficiency of the Almighty God? I believe without question God has commanded that I lift my eyes from what I can see to what I know to be the truth. If I run my life for Jesus Christ based upon what I see in my life or in the lives of others, then I have a very shaky foundation of evidence. But if I trust in God, then nothing should cause me to bolt from that position of calm, of rest, of joy, and peace in Jesus Christ. Not one thing should do that. Our text is saying, in no thing be terrified. In no thing be startled to bolt from your position of confidence in Christ by those opposing. Those opposing. Not one thing should pry you from that position of peace and rest and joy and confidence in Christ. Not one thing. Not hell. Not surrounding situations, not your business failures, your your family problems, your or government politics or 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 its policies, nothing. Not the condition in which the nation or the world finds itself. Not the attitude of your friends, not the attitude of your family. In no thing. There will be those who oppose. The text makes it clear that, that there will be those who oppose. 
The day will come when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to reign on earth, and we know that He's going to reign in perfect righteousness. Man's not going to do that. He's never going to do that. No matter how hard he tries, the world is not making progress toward peace. God has declared that there is no peace for the wicked. The only peace in, in all of God's created universe is found in in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And then my mind thinks, after a thousand years of that, it's inconceivable that anybody would want to unseat Jesus Christ. And yet we are told that at the end of that time, Satan's able in a moment of time to gather a multitude of people to go up against Jesus Christ at Jerusalem to unseat Jesus Christ. to unseat a perfect, righteous government. The reason Satan is able to gather people against Christ is because they do not want righteousness, okay? And we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. Dearly beloved, what we've been made, which is the righteousness of God in Christ, the world not only does not want that, but they hate it. They hate it. They hate it. Okay? More specifically, they hate you because of it. They hated Christ. They hate us. We were born into the idea that Satan's program is, is of the lowest kind of moral activity. I mean, you know, child pornography, incest, every other rotten thing that you can possibly imagine. I mean, that's where Satan scratches around. And I say that's not true. I am absolutely persuaded that Satan can whitewash a church as well as its pastor and even plant some, some pretty flowers out in front of the church. But you wouldn't need Christ. And then we see the one opposing and exalting himself above all that is called God, not the depravity of moral evil, but the depravity of spiritual evil. And so we know in the Lord Jesus Christ, the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and the walk that it, that's, that's our privilege in Jesus Christ is opposed on the grounds of righteousness. Not morality. If it was simply morality, I don't think we'd be told not to bolt and run by our adversaries. I would think that the 28th verse would not even be necessary if it was morality. Don't be bolted from your position of trust in Christ and walk in the peace and the joy of Christ because of spiritual evil. And that battleground, that area of conflict is in the area of righteousness so the conflict is one between the righteousness of god and the righteousness of man in the same area of conflict that that we see over and over again in the word of god that of the area of merit human merit versus the grace of god So the temptation, folks, that is so overwhelmingly strong in our lives, it's like the, a tide, you know, pulling on you. You know, it's just like a, a riptide almost. You know, the temptation is to be moved from that position of grace to the position of merit. Okay? It is very, 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 very strong. Okay? God says of righteous Lot dwelling in Sodom and Gomorrah that his righteous soul was vexed day after day by their unrighteous deeds. God says of you, you are righteousness living in unrighteousness. And the easiest thing in the world is to be persuaded that in order to become righteous, you got to make yourself righteous by human merit. And not one thing moved away from your position by those who oppose. That's what the verse says. 
And believe me, our brethren, our brothers and sisters in Christ today, I don't know if I, if I should say, I mean, I'll be all inclusive and just include myself. All of us, okay? All of us are constantly under the, the sway, the attack, the persuasion. We're, we're being persuaded to abandon our position of grace for the sake of human merit. That's, that's how it's always been, folks. It's how it's always been. This is not something new. This is something that's been going on for nearly 6,000 years. And not one thing moved away from your position by those who oppose. Okay? And those who oppose are the minions of Satan exalting themselves above all that is called God. Fantastic thought to realize that, that, that now the righteousness of God apart from the law is manifested, even the righteousness of God, which is by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. A simple set of words, clearly spoken, yet in all of my years, I have rarely, rarely heard that preached. It's always been that I can do something to affect that righteousness, whether it's by repenting, receiving, believing, or whatever. But to come face to face with the simple grand news of Christ's gospel, that God made me righteous in the faithfulness of Christ, is a secure position. But it's one from which we can be easily dislodged, moved away from. Oh, it's, it's just too good to be true, you know, because it's grace. It's not human works and human merit, you know, it, but it's grace. We always want to go back to the human merit system. We want to believe, folks, we want to believe that the reason God loves us is because we're lovable. And the reason he doesn't love somebody else is because that person isn't lovable. Therefore, we're better than that person because we're lovable. And therefore, we find our minds twisted back around to human merit from the grace of God. Just by that much. The temptation is overwhelming, folks, in our lives. And it was designed this way. Because we were, we were created, we were, we were given a body of flesh in which there is a conflict between the flesh and the spirit. I want you to take note of the fact that it's not saying that our being moved from our position in Christ has to do with our eternal destiny. We're not talking about life as, as far as eternal life and eternal death is concerned. We're not talking about heaven and hell here. We're talking about when we who were made righteous in Christ are moved away. We're already righteous in Christ. And we're moved away from that position because of the opposition Okay, of human righteousness, of, of human merit. It causes us to be moved away from our position. This, the reason I'm so passionate, I guess, about what the words that I'm talking about here is because, oh, Steve, you know, I don't know that was a great, you know, extemporaneous, you know, speech that you gave there, you know, on video on part 11 or whatever Philippians part or whatever folks this this is this has been on my mind for 35 years you are surrounded by it why and why should we stand on the side of our accuser and not with our advocate our Lord Jesus Christ the one who who, who is our advocate who stands before God day day and night as Satan stands before God accusing the brethren, or that Jesus, our advocate, points to the blood. I, it just makes no sense to side with Satan. Why should we as victors lose in a conflict between the righteousness of the man and the righteousness of God, which is 
to them an evident token of destruction, says the text. Not annihilation, but of, of, of your salvation. That you are not moved from that position of confidence in the work of Christ, rather than confidence in the work of men, which is a proof of their destruction and your deliverance. And there's an interesting structure there in the Greek. Their destruction hasn't come yet, okay? But your deliverance has. And don't be alarmed if they don't see that proof, which is manifest proof, an open proof. And you say, yeah, well, but they don't see that, Steve. They don't see that as a proof. But you do. If you believe what God has said. If you don't believe that you are as righteous as Jesus Christ himself, then folks, you don't believe God. Don't bother to tell me that you believe God because you don't. You don't. Uh, even, even so, by the disobedience of the one Adam, the many were made sinners. Even so, by the obedience of the one Jesus Christ, are we made righteous. You are not made righteous by how you live. Okay? Or by what I see in your life. Me, you know, standing back observing, you know, you and looking at your life. And, and in fact, I, in fact, may see the whitewashing that you do to cover the horror of your carnal nature. Dearly beloved, you are made righteous because of the obedience of Christ, not the obedience of yourself. And to stand securely in that position, to stand squarely on that truth is to excite and invite opposition. And that opposition is an absolute proof that you are presently delivered and those opposing face judgment. And believe me, the proof will be there. Every mouth will be stopped. God will force them to their knees. Romans chapter 9. What if God who willed to show his wrath against sin endured with much long suffering vessels of wrath which he prepared beforehand for destruction? This is our word. This is our word. If it is God's intent, and it is, that's the first class condition. Since it is God's intent, among other things, to show his wrath against sin. When the day comes, that proof will be there. And will you please note that it will not only be a proof of their judgment, but of your deliverance. And the word salvation does not mean eternal life, but deliverance. This is an evident proof of our deliverance. Now, I recognize that, the, that those who are delivered have eternal life and I recognize that those who are delivered are made righteous and I recognize that those who are delivered are reconciled but I don't believe that is sufficient proof to suggest that the words are all synonyms and that they all mean the same thing we have been delivered in this particular context from the human merit system okay the text is telling you, you have been delivered from the human merit system. It's an evident token of their destruction, spiritual ruin, and your deliverance. Destruction, spiritual ruin. And I do not by any means want anyone to get the impression that, that what I'm saying here is that that these ones are all going to hell. That this is this. I know it's it's maybe a little bit difficult for us all, any of us, to wrap our minds around the fact that our own brothers and sisters can hate us, okay, and oppose the truth. But that's always been the case, folks. 
We've been delivered from the human merit system, the law, from judgment. Our judgment fell on Christ. There's therefore now no judgment to those of you who are in Christ Jesus. And as clear as those words are, why then do Christians in the main, and I mean just about everybody I talk to, why is it why is it that they're persuaded, they are persuaded that they face a day of judgment for sin? Why is that? I am well aware of the fact that God's word declares that we who are God's people will give an accounting for how we built on Christ. I've talked about this in the past. And we may or we may not receive a reward, but that, is, that isn't a judgment for sin. I do not face judgment for sin. You do not face judgment for sin. You don't face the destruction here unless... You either don't belong to Christ or you're living under law instead of grace. The word means spiritual ruin. Okay? Doesn't mean, doesn't mean annihilation. Doesn't necessarily imply hell here. It, is, it means spiritual ruin. So you don't face that destruction unless you either don't belong to Christ or you do belong to Christ, but you're living under law and not grace. And you are literally hounding and persecuting and hating your own brother, brothers and sisters in the Lord for, for believing the truth, standing solidly, unmovable, not bolting, okay? Because of the opposition, on the on the standing squarely on the fact that God chose them, and that there's no human merit involved, and if you make it your life's ambition, especially if you know you YouTube warriors, if that's your life's ambition is to beat up on believers who are literally, quite simply trusting God that God chose them, they didn't choose. God, but God chose them. And there's, there's no human merit involved that we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ as opposed to self-righteousness and the trying going about establishing our own righteousness based upon the law. If that's what you are doing, folks, I feel sorry for you. All right. You have my deepest sympathy. Especially if you are my brother or my sister in Christ. Why do you not hear my words? Because you cannot. You who are of your father, the devil. You can't hear my words. So I'm not speaking to those really who are, are, are not God's children in the main. It, it's What's surprising about this text is that you see, you see uh, the possibility that, that you could be a brother or a sister, my brother or sister, in Christ and persecute me for standing on the... On, Hard on the fact that God chose me and that there's no human merit involved in our walk in life and relationship with Christ. Okay? It's a, it's how God, does God have anything against such a person as that? If, if they belong to Christ, he does not. But that's just the, the point I'm trying to make here is, is that you have a passage that says that a believer can be doing this. Okay, we're not just looking at non-believers here. Christians can be doing this to other Christians. And basically what they're doing is they're acting like those who are, are not in Christ at all. That's what I want you to see. And since you are God's child, you are righteous and you don't face judgment. These others do that aren't in Christ. But you've already been delivered. You, you, are, you are righteous. You are already righteous. You already have eternal life. You, 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 you are already reconciled in this context. You're, you're already delivered from judgment. Okay? Imagine that. And, and then... And yet you... 
in your zeal and your enthusiasm for God, you go about trying to establish your own righteousness. And, and you can't do that. You can't do that without persecuting the children of God. Even if, even if you, it's your own brothers and sisters in Christ. So those who are opposing may be believers, but you were promised to Christ before you ever knew it, just as Isaac was, just as he that was born after the flesh persecutes, opposes that which was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what says the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not absolutely not be heir with the son of the free woman. So we're not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. But you can live like children, a child of the bondwoman. Okay? You can do that. Those born after the flesh. These are those who are teaching human merit, law. I mean, what happened in Galatians? Well, they accepted Christ. They believed in Christ. And along came the Judaizers who said, well, that's all great. That's fine and dandy and all. But you got to be circumcised. You got you to be circumcised. You got to keep the law. And God says, cast them out. Cast them out. Now, and then the argument that always comes up as you study this passage of Scripture is, well, were, were any of those Judaizers God's children? Were any of those who came in and preached that Christians? It's a good thing to trust Christ and you're redeemed by Christ and you're made righteous by Christ, but after all, you got to keep the law. And your dear brother in the Lord, whom you know, Lo you know he loves the Lord, says that you are not righteous unless you keep the Ten Commandments. And of course, of course, you know that that dear brother doesn't know what he's talking about. But if you're asking me to believe that he's not a brother in Christ, I can't believe that. I believe he knows and loves the same Lord as you do, and that he's headed for heaven. But in his conversation, in his conduct, He's a Judaizer, so I cast that out. I believe he's opposing the gospel of grace. But I don't believe he's headed for hell. And I don't believe he faces judgment because he stands under the same grace in which I stand. You know, you may not want to revisit some of the things that you thought or believed or, or, or maybe even wrote about 40, 50 years ago. I know I wouldn't. You know, Schofield, he grew up and he changed his mind. You know, he wrote, he wrote that a man was redeemed in the old covenant by keeping the law, and in the new covenant, he was redeemed by grace. Now, I, know, I happen to know that, that he grew up and he changed his mind. The problem is that a printing press recorded that. He said that, and he put it in the early editions of the Schofield Bible. He later re repudiated that, but most of modern Christianity doesn't know that he repudiated that. And I think every other saint that opposes the free grace of God will soon enough become aware of that error. But there's no judgment for those who are in Christ. No judgment. You know, I think it'd be naive to suggest that, that none of the opposition, folks, comes from those who are members of the body of Christ. That's just, I can't go there with that. I think some of it does. Is casting out the Judaizers in Galatians 4, casting out brethren in Christ. Well, the only answer that makes sense to me is that they, they may be cast out or not cast out. And for the most part, I don't think that they are often cast out. God's, they need cast out. God's people who speak in ignorance are not being cast out. And they should be. Okay? No, we don't hate them back. We don't stop loving them. But we cast them out. While God's people who preach the purity of the gospel, who are not opposing in ignorance, who don't face judgment, are cast out.
or it may be it may be more proper to say that our being cast out is really more God having delivered us from that ignorance. They cast you out, cast you aside, hate you, persecute you for righteousness sake. I think, I think you, sh you can consider yourself blessed. I think that is your deliverance. You wouldn't be in that position if, if you weren't, if you didn't fit, plug it right into the context here, fit right into the description of those who, whom God says have been delivered. You've been delivered. That's why you're being hated. That's why you're being persecuted. But for them, it is an evident token of spiritual ruin. Spiritual ruin. In the next video, I want to talk a little bit about John, something that took everybody's familiar with, John chapter 5, the Gospel of John chapter 5. Uh, just if you just start at the top of the chapter, you begin reading at verse 1, and and, and we're going to be looking at that, and we're going to be looking at, at how that, that relates to the topic that, that we discussed here in this video. Dearly beloved, my heart for 35 years has been weighted down with such a heavy burden for those believers for whom Christ died who are living in abject frustration, failure, bewilderment, confusion. Oh, Steve, I got a message today from a believer Oh, I'm just, I'm so confused, you know, it's, I don't understand, I, I look in my Bible and I see on the one hand we're forgiven, and I, I see that, on, you know, that He loves us, that we're forgiven, that He's uh, forgiven us all our trespasses, that we're under grace, that we're not under law, but then I go to other places in scripture and and it appears to me like you know that christ has something against those who don't don't straighten their lives up and fly right and so i'm confused i can't emphasize enough just how strong a temptation it is to be to be uh, to allow ourselves to be moved away from the position in which God's placed us. Away from the righteousness of God to human merit. Folks, it happens every single day of your life in some form or another. Whether it comes through in, in the, by means, by way of a, of a thought that just passes through your head or some circumstances that you're going through. Some particular circumstance God has placed you in. It's going to happen. It's always going to happen. It always has happened. It's just a fact of the Christian life. I've got a whole lot more I want to say about this in the next video, so I ask that you bear with me, and, and I want you to all know just how much I love you. I truly do. I love you all with the love of Christ. I appreciate you so much I, that I don't even have the words to begin to tell you. I appreciate all of the comments that you leave, all the messages, the emails, all of your all of your input, all of the words, the kind words of encouragement that you give me. I appreciate you supporting this channel. I appreciate you so much. And I ask that you continue to pray for the direction of this ministry as we go forward through the year 2021. Until next time, thanks for watching.